All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dave, for inviting me um, to give this talk. My name is Audrey Redford, as Dave said. Uh, my PhD is from Texas Tech University. And my uh, dissertation and the vast majority of the research that I have published has been um, in some way, shape, or form related to uh, the economics of drug prohibition. Um, so just a tiny little bit of background. Um, growing up, my mother was a substance use disorder counselor, and she now uh, manages substance use disorder treatment programs. So these were kind of topics uh, that we always talked about in my household in one way or another. Um, and it was actually kind of this interest of mine in trying to understand why you know drug use and drug prohibition didn't seem to be working that actually got me really interested in economics um, because it was it provided me with this lens by which to understand this problem and to see like why we sometimes keep getting these unintended outcomes um, that aren't necessarily desirable. So that's basically what we're going to talk about today. Um, the header for the title is bath salts, brown acid, and bad batches, and we're going to talk about each of those three things um, in some way, shape, or form. But to kind of get things started or to give you a, a frame of reference here to think about uh, with this particular presentation is kind of this graph. So a large bo body of my work is basically trying to understand why this graph is shaped this way. So this is a figure um, that I pulled a while back. As you can see, it only goes up to 2006, and I'll give you some of the more recent charts in just a moment. Um, but basically in 1970, President Nixon kind of declared drugs as being public enemy number one. And there was a large concerted effort at the federal level um, in a lot of different ways, primarily through the creation of what we now know to be the Drug Enforcement Administration, um, or the DEA to spend quite a bit of money in order to combat this kind of drug problem um, as it was perceived by uh, both state and federal governments. But over the same time that spending since 1970 at the federal level has increased both in trying to reduce the supply of drugs as well as reduce demand for those substances, we can see that as more money has been spent over time, actually the number of unintentional drug overdose deaths has increased. And this is kind of confounding, right? So like the purpose of the federal government and state government spending all this money is hopefully to actually decrease uh, these particular outcomes. So part of it is just simply trying to figure out if the goal of kind of the war on drugs is to promote a safer and healthier society, why, why is this outcome uh, panning out? And to give you a little bit clearer of a picture that I think might provide some context for a lot of the um, discussion in not only the health economics discipline, but just in society more broadly, has been this significant upswing in the number of unintentional drug overdose deaths that have involved opioids um, over the past almost 10 years now. Um, it's been a pretty considerable uptick uh, since about 2010. And if you think about that just as an extension to the previous graph before, this is again confounding and hopefully we can try to see some insights as to perhaps why this is happening and maybe thinking about some implications for policy moving, moving forward. Um, this is from the uh, CDC just at the end of uh, 2020. But one of the big problems that COVID has actually presented beyond just the problems that we all um, are aware of is that um, the number yet again of unintentional drug overdose deaths has actually been steadily increasing during the pandemic. And while some of it has been uh, contributed to aspects related to lockdowns, people not being able to spend time with their friends, um, seeking out other alternatives of basically entertainment and things to keep themselves busy, um, this actual uptick in the largest number or the greatest rate of unintentional drug overdose deaths in recorded U.S. history has actually been going on for over a year now. And so again, trying to think about what are some of the um, aspects of policy and what's going on in society that could be contributing to these things. 
Um, I always like to, when I give talks like this, give a little bit of context specific to uh, who I'm talking to. So since you guys are in Michigan, I thought I would pull um, a graph of what's been going on in Michigan specifically. And as you can see, this trend, this uptick has been pretty consistent and is actually higher, uh, it's a higher rate um, than the average in, in the United States. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse basically has cited that um, the rate of unintentional drug overdose deaths in Michigan, 78% um, of them uh, involved an opioid. And then uh, there, it was roughly at a rate of 20.8 individuals per 100,000, whereas the US average is 14.6. And one thing that I just wanna note here that again, is gonna be part of this presentation that I'm gonna um, discuss is the fact that where a lot of this seems to be coming from is from the, these synthetic opioids, primarily fentanyl analogs, and not this idea that it's prescription opioids that are actually driving a large portion of this crisis. So we're going to talk about kind of first for the average person, what the heck is this fentanyl thing? Why do I hear about it so often in the news? Where does it come from? And then I'm going to kind of pitch you the argument that it is precisely a byproduct of prohibition. And that a lot of the deaths associated with this are due to the fact that the substance of choice that many of these individuals want to use, such as heroin, or prescription opioids that people would like to use for recreational purposes outside of just prescription for things like pain management are contributing to this particular problem. All right, here are some graphs. Uh, this might be slightly more meaningful to you all. I've only been to Michigan once. Um, I gave a talk at Hillsdale a couple of years back, but just some uh, information for you to think about um, related to fatal overdoses, perhaps you know in your hometowns or in areas near where you all are currently. Um, and this is again, just a chart specific to Michigan to show that um, 2020 was considerably higher for these things. So a very prevalent talk and con uh, concept for us to be thinking about. So to kind of relate this and frame this a little bit in the context of economics more broadly, or to give you a little bit of insight into how I approach this and many scholars who also work on um, this in this area, think about it, is basically threefold. So the first question that I'm always interested in is basically first treating individuals in the production process of uh, illicit substances like any other entrepreneur in any market. Um, what we've basically found over time is that talking about uh, the choice set available to these producers as something radically different than what we would attribute to any other market producer um, in, in markets legal or illegal is not actually particularly helpful. So instead what we need to think about is how does policy basically change the incentives for these entrepreneurs? Um, then as a result, if these producers of these substances or these entrepreneurs are put in a situation where they have to adapt to these various types of policy changes, how does that adaptation manifest in the types of products that they sell and how it ends up affecting consumers? And then finally, kind of adding a dynamic component to this, as the product, the nature of these products change over time in response to policies, how does that then shape future policies? So these are kind of the big questions that I've been trying to tackle with. And so what the presentation today is gonna to kind of do is bring these ideas forward to really think about how we're getting some of these really horrific outcomes related to drug prohibition. If we just acknowledge that these producers are quite similar um, to producers in any other market, they just have to tackle some slightly different constraints and incentives. All right, so let me skip over here. So mainly I use, um, Dave has possibly talked about some of these in uh, classes for you all who've had him uh, as, as a professor, but kind of this idea of using market process theory to explain the evolution of drug control policy, thinking about entrepreneurs in these markets as uh, agents who respond to policy changes, and then again, thinking about those unintended consequences. So in the time that we have, I'm gonna to try to tackle most of these kind of insights um, from economics and, sh and 
highlight to you how they manifest um, in this particular market. So thinking about how uh, the existence of drug prohibition changes and alters the incentives for suppliers, uh, what impact does this then have on the potency of the substances that are then sold in these markets? Um, how does it also change the nature of the products being sold? So the prevalence of things like substitute goods, uh, if, the, if the substance you want or the good that you want um, in this particular instance is not available or it's very costly due to the fact that it's illegal, might you then go out and seek other substitutes or other alternatives just like, you know, if your favorite cereal isn't available in the grocery store and you still want to eat breakfast and you start thinking about those other alternatives. Um, and then finally, how this creates a whole variety of information asymmetries that make treating these particular uh, use disorders as well as instances of overdose quite challenging. And then if we have time, I want to talk a little bit about how this can create some rather perverse incentives for law enforcement given that law enforcement officers, just like anyone else, they have to respond to incentives. And a large portion of those incentives involve things like uh, generating sufficient revenue to keep their uh, department uh, thriving, to pay for you know, overtime requirements and things like that. All right, so one of the things that I like to kind of do to kind of give you a starting point is to first talk about what really is the difference, the fundamental difference between illegal drug markets and legal drug markets. Or to put it slightly differently, how this particular substance, so this particular substance being heroin, compares to when heroin used to be legal in the United States. Um, it was, heroin was originally produced um, and sold by Bayer. It was about as prevalent in people's medicine cabinets as aspirin is today. Um, and is compared to this other particular drug, such as in this case, I just pulled a picture of um, a liquor store in the vodka aisle, right? So all three of these substances and their illegal and formerly legal and currently legal forms are all addictive substances. Um, in fact, alcohol withdrawal, unlike heroin withdrawal, can actually kill you. So there are many margins on which alcohol and some of the illicit substances that are legal actually have far greater consequences and deadlier consequences than some that are not illegal. So that's worth kind of thinking about in the back of your mind. But if you're someone who's producing and selling in these particular markets, it's worth thinking about, well, what's different between them? So when we think about prohibition, it's a little bit of a misnomer because while we call it drug prohibition, it is definitely not the case that it is impossible to find drugs that are prohibited right? Like it might be a little bit more challenging and people might not advertise on television that they sell these illicit substances, but they are in fact easy to get. And it is the case that in legal markets, thinking about alcohol, a lot of times we try to, as a society, limit people's access by introducing things like sin taxes, which then make that product a little bit more expensive in the hopes that it will discourage some consumption. Other than those two distinctions, the way that illegal and legal drug markets operate are not that different, right? So producers and entrepreneurs in both sets of markets seek to maximize profits. They still have to both make decisions on the margin. So these primary goals of profit maximization are the same. The only real difference is what they have to do in order to achieve profits. That's where things start to look a little bit different. So if we kind of keep in mind that illicit entrepreneurs, we don't want to start giving attributes to these individuals that aren't necessarily true or try to put them in some sort of box that's radically different than any other human behavior, because that's not a helpful way to gain any sort of insight. So if we think of them just as functionally any other producer with quite a few extra costs, that begins to help us better understand why we get some of these particular outcomes. And to kind of uh, throw tribute to, I guess, Liam Neeson and Taken, right? Like uh, illicit entrepreneurs have a particular set of skills, right? They have certain skills that are useful to them in the institutional environment that they operate. And those useful sets of skills might not actually be super useful or even desirable at all if those markets were in fact legal and vice versa. So that's how we're going to kind of talk about this moving um, forward. 
when we think about the particular skill set that individuals operating in an illegal market have to have, um, a lot of it just simply it revolves around the idea that when we think about the enforcement of contracts or ensuring that people are going to uphold their end of some sort of an agreement, we in our general legal interactions with each other oftentimes don't really even question whether or not someone's going to follow through, right? We oftentimes aren't second guessing our friends constantly because we have this notion of, you know, repeated interactions. When I go into CVS to pick up ibuprofen because I have a headache, I'm not fretting over the fact that CVS is instead going to sell me, you know, brown M&Ms or, you know, Smarties that are painted that light color brown instead of actually selling me ibuprofen. And that primarily is because there are a lot of the institutional environment, particularly this aspect of rule of law and contract enforcement that I kind of assume to be upheld. And it works out for me because now I don't have to invest a lot in doing like background checks on CVS to make sure that they're actually going to uphold their end of the bargain. But in, in illegal markets, they can't rely on the same court and tort system that you and I can, right? If there is some sort of an illicit drug transaction, so say individual A sells uh, baby powder to individual B and individual B thought that they were instead actually purchasing cocaine. Individual B can't call up their lawyer or can't call up local law enforcement and say, hey, you know, I was just defrauded, right? They would go to prison and likely would take the person that sold to them to prison as well. So they end up having to rely on alternative mechanisms, essentially, to enforce contracts that we don't have to rely on anymore. And if you actually do a bit of a historic comparison, a lot of the attributes about um, the way in which people, particularly people um, in various groups and organizations who had previously not interacted with each other, kind of early uh, societal interactions, if you look at that economic history, a lot of the way in which those individuals operate looks quite a bit like the way that illegal markets operate. And it's mainly because those institutional foundations aren't there. So because these individuals not only have to find creative ways to enforce contracts, and it turns out threats of violence, um, credible threats of violence are a very effective way to encourage people to play along nicely with you, as well as trying to avoid arrest and lengthy incarceration, you have to be pretty good at evading law enforcement. So these end up becoming desirable attributes of people working in these particular markets, not necessarily because there's anything inherent about making a substance that people enjoy using that requires people to be very violent. Those two things don't go hand in hand, but because in order to effectively sell those substances that make people feel good, in an illegal environment, you now actually need to be quite good on several of these other margins. And then finally, we have to think about the fact that we oftentimes see people in operating in these illicit markets that aren't necessarily afraid of tacking on another prison sentence. So if you think about the additional cost to someone who's engaged in a considerable long time in illegal markets, where if they are in fact ever arrested, they're likely going to be incarcerated for a significant period of time. If you're already facing 30 years in prison, if you're caught, engaging in one more criminal activity that's going to add perhaps 18 months to five years to your prison sentence is quite a different thought calculus than you or I who, despite the fact that according to the literature, the average person in the United States, I think it's commits three felonies a day unintentionally, Right? So, but most of us are law-abiding individuals, at least with our intention. The thought of us going to prison for 18 to five years is a considerably different cost calculus that is oftentimes prohibitive enough for us to not engage in those activities. So we end up actually encouraging criminals to get involved in these markets because they're the only ones that actually have the cost structure as well as that skill set to even begin to profit in these markets, lest they be arrested and things like that, as you or I might be, because we simply wouldn't know how to operate in those, in those particular contexts. So as an economist, I had to give you one supply and demand diagram, I'm sorry, but I had to do it. 
Um, so if we think about the fact that uh, you can kind of graph, if you will, prohibition as a tax, or you can kind of think about it as an additional cost of doing business. Um, the demand for most illicit substances is what we would consider highly inelastic or not very price sensitive, which just simply means that even if there's a significant decrease in supply, if the federal government is doing a pretty good job of fighting a supply side war that discourages uh, everyday law-abiding citizens from actually selling these now illegal substances, we actually see that the reduction in quantity is quite small. However, the increase in the price tag that's paid for those particular substances is rather large. It's also worth noting, just as a small aside, that if demand for these substances is truly as inelastic as we estimate it to be, it's also the case that if these substances were to become legalized, where, where now we would see an increase in supply, also note that if there's a massive increase in supply, there's also likely not going to be a very large increase in the quantity consumed either. So that's kind of always one thing that I like to add is that that inelasticity component cuts both ways. So I compare it oftentimes to smoking. Most of us know that there are a considerable number of negative side effects and consequences associated with smoking. Smoking is illegal and arguably given the addictive nature of nicotine as it's been pretty consistently stated that it's likely in the top three most addictive substances known to man, that demand curve is highly inelastic. But cigarettes are illegal, yet we don't see that all of us are pack-a-day smokers like my father was for a considerably long period of time. He only very recently just quit and it seems to be sticking, you know, knock on wood, right? So for the same reason that we're not all pack-a-day smokers, it's also reasonable to believe that people will understand the negative consequences associated with many with significant misuse of these illegal substances that if we were to legalize them we probably wouldn't see that massive of an increase in quantity consumed either all right so if we take those ideas that i talked about before cost of doing illegal business this is going to end up creating a pretty profitable opportunity for drug entrepreneurs that have that particular skill set and so as a result, we're going to tend to see an increase in the, in the proportion of sellers that are already involved in some sort of criminal activity simply because they possess the skill set that's going to enable them to extract those profits um, that are available in that market, which is going to, again, lead to kind of these higher barriers to entry that your average person is not going to be able to meet. And so you tend to actually have um, situations in illegal markets that tend to look a lot more in the cartel form or more of your oligopolies or in even some jurisdictional areas, they have monopoly control over certain environments. So the way that I think is the easiest to kind of think about this for those of you, though I recently surveyed um, my principles of micro and macro classes and the number of people who have not in fact seen the television show Breaking Bad is very, very low. So while my first homework assignment would be that if you're going to watch any television show related to this topic, it is far and above the wire. That's arguably in my mind, and not just mine, in the mind of many, that the best television show of all time was The Wire. So if you're going to watch a TV show, that's the first one. Second one on this topic would be Breaking Bad. But for those of you who have seen Breaking Bad, you can kind of think of it similar to the way in which Walter White changed throughout the course of the series, right? He was initially kind of this dorky high school teacher who eventually became the one who knocks, right? He had to adapt his temperament, his ability to effectively and realistically threaten violence throughout the course of the show in order to effectively kind of maintain his uh, predominant uh, presence in this methamphetamine market. And we can kind of think of this as similar to the fact that your drug dealer, if you will, in the early 1900s was your local pharmacist. That individual knew everything about you. They knew your family and they knew people in the community, right? This was your heroin dealer in 1905. You would go and buy stuff from him. You would you know, verify if I'm taking this for my cough or there are things that I should be worried about. He would encourage you not to drink alcohol while taking heroin, all of these kind of things. And, and you went to them and their name was typically on the store 
front, right? Whereas now most of your illicit drug transactions, if they actually happen in person at all, and they're not just simply someone mailing it to you that you met on the dark web, they take place with a considerable amount of anonymity and they tend to be very quick. So there's not a long discussion here about, you know, what exactly is this that you're selling me? I happen to be on these other medications. Can I ask you about any adverse side effects of mixing these substances, things like that? There's often likelihood of uh, a high or a high likelihood, excuse me, of these individuals being armed or prepared to exact violence if something goes on. So over time, the nature of who these suppliers are has changed, not because there's necessarily anything inherent at all in the business of selling substances that cure ailments and make people feel good, but instead, as these prohibitionist policies have intensified over time, it is encouraged this greater anonymity and this greater criminal element to operate in these particular markets. Another thing I wanna talk about, cause this comes up quite a bit is thinking about how potency has varied over time, right? So people always will say things like, you know, the, the marijuana that your grandpa smoked in the sixties was nowhere near as potent as the stuff those kids are doing today. Um, and that is true, but it's, off, it's important to kind of think about why that might be the case. And actually, as we've seen states legalize marijuana for recreational purposes, we've actually noticed that the uh, THC content that people consume, again, recreationally, medicinally aside, has actually declined, uh, which seems to suggest that the fact that THC, the potency, the THC uh, prevalence within marijuana content over time was growing due to other factors beyond just Will people demand things, uh, demand a more potent product? It also is kind of, uh, you could think of it as a similar thought experiment to um, alcohol, right? Like most people, when they want to go out and have a good time, are not just drinking Everclear or grain alcohol out of a bottle, right? They're doing it in order to be social, to engage in these kind of behaviors. And sometimes that means drinking, you know, a Michelob Ultra. And sometimes that might mean drinking a martini or something in between. So it's not the case that people always want the most potent thing. We don't see that in any other market. So why would we just erroneously attribute that here? So there must be some other cause. And I'm going to suggest to you, and the data seems to back this up, that a large reason for this increase in potency has nothing to do with the demand side. It's entirely due to trying to actually traffic these illegal substances. So these are just some pictures of various creative ways that drug traffickers have found to try to move products, particularly over international borders. Um, so hiding it in various things. Now, it is important to know that if you have um, an individual who is caught involved in the trafficking of illegal drugs, the amount of the drug that they are caught moving is a factor in the prison sentence that they're likely to face. Also the type of substance that they're trafficking, whether they're trafficking marijuana or heroin or PCP, right? So what we're gonna see is the fact that if your goal is to evade law enforcement, right? We're gonna assume that most drug dealers are not strategically trying to be arrested in the course of these business transactions they have a really strong incentive to try to minimize the amount of the actual substance that they're moving around. But the problem is, is that the fewer amounts of the substance that you're moving around could lead to less profit on the end. So what it ends up incentivizing is that since you still want to remain profitable, but you want to try to minimize the likelihood of being detected, and if you are detected, the likely or the length of your prison sentence, the goal ends up being to try to traffic smaller quantities of the most potent drug possible so that that way you can still keep your revenue prospects high, but also keep the likelihood of being detected. And if you, again, are detected, keeping your prison sentences relatively lower than they otherwise could be. I'll throw this in here too, because while it is kind of fun and interesting to look at surfboard stuff with cocaine, this also actually has a very important human component to it as well because the over the past 25 years the prevalence of individuals actually trafficking drugs inside of their systems as a means by which to avoid detection has increased 
So this is from an autopsy that was performed on a 16 year old female who was basically recruited by um, an illegal drug organization to what they referred to as body pack. So she had swallowed um, condoms full of heroin and she died because one of the condoms that the drug was in ruptured. And so as a result, she, she died of a drug overdose in transit. And it's important to kind of bring this up because it's not random that a lot of these organizations tend to operate in countries where rule of law, protection of property rights, and just overall standards of living are, are quite low. So they will oftentimes coerce people, even kidnap people, or in some sense, just offer you know, small amounts of money that those families desperately need because they don't have other alternatives and basically recruit individuals to engage in this kind of activity. And it tends to be more often than not women and children that are recruited because they're the least likely to be stopped by border patrol agents when they cross those lines. So I just, I really do wanna uh, kind of bring this back and make sure that we, we see that this has, you know, there's a very large human travesty component to this. Um, and, and why we should really take seriously the idea that, you know, prohibition has contributed to this. Because in, in no legal setting would this be, you know, the incentive compatible method by which to, to move products, especially products that we know have the potential um, to kill individuals. So this notion of trying to increase potency is basically an application of what's called the Alshin Allen effect, which is just simply the idea and thinking about how um, a fixed cost across two different types of goods is going to change the relative cost between those two goods. So the typical example or the original example was thinking about um, if you had two types of apples that were being um, shipped to you, you had your standard apple and you had your kind of choice apple. Think of it as like a premium or better quality apple. But both apples had to be shipped to you. And so each apple, let's say, costs five cents in order for it to be shipped to you. Now, if you compare the original price for the pound of apples in addition to the transport costs, now, relatively speaking, that choice apple looks relatively cheaper compared to the standard apple than it did before. This is a very similar application when we think about trafficking illicit drugs. You can traffic very pure, you know, 95% plus pure cocaine or cocaine that has already been cut or diluted down to purity levels that are actually safe for human consumption. But if you think of the uh, risk of being captured by law enforcement and the prison sentence as being equivalent to the transport cost, because the DEA doesn't care if you've got 95% pure cocaine or 50% pure cocaine that's been mixed with baking powder. You're going to be charged for the total weight that you're trafficking under uh, in the context of cocaine. So you then have an incentive to try to keep those quantity amounts small so that you're moving them around, decreasing the risk of detection, but then also decreasing the potential length of your prison sentence if you are able to traffic you know, 100 kilos instead of 300 kilos. That's going to be very different in terms of the prison sentence you're likely um, to be met with. We also have seen some other instances of how this potency uh, story has played out over time. So I've done some research on the origins of uh, heroin misuse in the United States and a non-negligible amount of heroin misuse in the U.S. stemmed from when cities we're closing down opium dens. Um, so as a result, people who were previously smoking opium in a social kind of setting were no longer able to do that. So they sought out other alternatives and the other alternatives available to them. One of them was heroin. Well, it turns out that heroin is significantly more potent than smoking opium. So unintentionally, these various laws encouraged individuals to engage in an even riskier and uh, more potent behavior than they had been before. Somewhat similar story into the cocaine versus crack cocaine in the mid 1980s. So it is the case, and I want to be very clear about this because this is a huge misconception, that once it is in the body, 
cocaine and crack cocaine are the exact same substances. The only difference is in their chemical configuration initially in how you consume it. So cocaine in its powder form can either be snorted intranasally, you can eat it, um, or you can mix it with water, um, heat it up and inject it intravenously. You cannot smoke powder cocaine. Crack cocaine came about as a method by which to what they call freebase, they got rid of the chloride base on cocaine by making it into this rock-like substance that you can then smoke. And smoking became desirable and is typically more potent because now what happens is you're inhaling the smoke through the nasal passages as well as into the lungs, which creates a much faster vehicle to get to the brain for it to have those euphoric effects. So what they end up finding was that if you compared it to individuals who were previously snorting cocaine versus smoking crack cocaine, you could use a smaller amount of the drug by smoking it in order to achieve that same high. And so again, as cocaine got more and more expensive, crack became a desirable option because it could be afforded by a variety of different individuals, not just wealthy individuals, and you needed a smaller amount of it in order to achieve that same high. All right, um, I wanna talk about this for a little bit, mainly because I wanna toot my own horn, if you will, to talk about this term that I made up, um, but also where a lot of my research is focused on this kind of entrepreneurial aspect um, of illicit drug markets. So a few years back, I published a paper, Don't Eat the Brown Acid, which is a line from Woodstock. There was a bad batch of acid um, that was floating around. So many of the bands and performers when they got up on stage to perform would remind the crowd, you know, don't eat the brown acid, avoid that acid that's brown so that you don't have a bad trip or, you know, end up in the medic tent. Um, so I wrote this paper basically talking about how the piece of legislation that was passed in the 1970s, the Controlled Substances Act, which dramatically changed the way in which the federal government deals with drug prohibition. And it is the, um, the framework that we still utilize today. While its intention was to try to solve a lot of problems related to um, conveying much more about the health and safety of these various drugs to the general public, it actually created and exacerbated a lot of the very problems that it was trying to avoid and prevent. So very long story short, some of you may already know this, the way that the federal government classifies drugs is in five schedule categories. The smaller the number, the more prohibited that particular substance is. So schedule one substances or where you find a lot of your bad hard drugs or a schedule five substances or possibly even things that you have in your medicine cabinet and that you can very easily buy at CVS without even having to show your ID. So the reason for the classification was twofold. The first one was as a way to try to convey information about these drugs. If you knew a class one drug was different than a class three drug, you would have some insight into the fact that they have very different safety requirements and safety uh, accepted uses. But also the scheduling apparatus is what's used to delve out punishments. So the smaller the number, the more punitive, oftentimes prison sentences and things like that are the lower the number when it comes to trafficking or selling these substances in a way that is illegal, not, not as uh, big of a deal, or at least not as lengthy of prison sentences, particularly when you get into your mandatory minimums. And the schedule criteria is threefold. Is there an accepted medical use in the United States? Is there an accepted safety standard? And what are those safety standards? And is there potential for addiction as identified by the federal government? So here are just some examples of different schedule substances. So you'll see that schedule one substances include things like heroin and mescaline, but marijuana is also a schedule one substance, right? So this has been the problem or the, the, the slow evolution of this slow trend to kind of legalize marijuana. The reason why it is not legal or accessible in all states is because it falls into the schedule one category, which means that there are no accepted safety standards um, at least when it was passed in the 1970s, there was a lot of bad science going on talking about the gateway effect that led people to believe there was a high um, 
propensity for addiction. And then finally, there are no accepted safe, um, safe medical uses as deemed by the federal government. And the reason for that is because in 1970, the federal government did not recognize any medical uses for marijuana. And so it got thrown into that category because of it. And since then, because it's a Schedule One drug, it is very challenging to get um, the exception waivers to do any sort of research to perhaps even begin to suggest that there are medical uses that should be accepted by uh, the federal government. So I just wanted to throw in there like why marijuana is up there, but cocaine and meth aren't. It's because cocaine and meth have accepted safety standards and accepted medical uses and are actually still used um, medically. Um, marijuana is not, at least as recognized by the federal government. That will likely change um, in the next five years, but there's a little bit of kind of the history um, behind it. So as you kind of move down the schedule, particularly after you go from schedule one and two down to three, the penalties associated with trafficking and selling these drugs change dramatically. It's also important to point out that the substances are scheduled based off of their chemical names and not necessarily by what individuals might call it in the market. So what I tried to do was identify three different incentives that having such a scheduling mechanism creates. If you're gonna have this definitive list of drugs that are good, not so good, and really bad, and you lump them into these various bins, how is that going to alter the incentive structure that entrepreneurs operating in these markets see? So I went through and talked about three different ones and there's one, the analog one is the main one I wanna to talk to you about today because I think that it's what's playing the largest driving role in the current fentanyl crisis that we're thinking about. So the first one is if schedule one and two are really bad and they're gonna have hefty mandatory minimum prison sentences with them, but schedules three, four, and five aren't, it encourages these producers to find ways in which to identify recreational uses for lower scheduled drugs. So the prevalence of PCP in the 1970s is a byproduct of this. People didn't wanna use PCP for recreational purposes in the 60s because they used other substances like MDMA and MDA. So other um, stimulants, kind of party drugs. PCP wasn't desirable. But as soon as MDA and MDMA were dumped into the Schedule II category that now had very hefty prison sentences associated with its sale, production, and trafficking, now all of a sudden PCP grows in popularity, not because people necessarily want to use it, but because it's much easier to access and it is less costly to sell if you have concerns about being detected and caught by police. The second one is creating analogs or slight chemical modifications for drugs that are on the illegal list, but modifying them ever so slightly so that the chemical is technically different where now that chemical that you're selling, even if you're calling it the old name, is different enough where it's technically not illegal according to the federal government. And then the final one was finding all sorts of new experimental um, drugs like cathinones and things like that. So like spice and K2 and that whole series of uh, drugs that have become more and more popular over the last 10, 15 years. So I want to talk a little bit about the fentanyl crisis. It is the case, and you should know this, that fentanyl proper is actually a substance that if you've ever been under general anesthesia, you've probably consumed. Um, EMS carry fentanyl. Fentanyl is very prevalently used in hospitals as a way to try to manage traumatic pain. It is a very powerful pain reliever. It is very effective at its job. However, most of the drugs or most of the fentanyls that are sold on the street are not actually hospital grade fentanyl. They're kind of like, think of it as a distant cousin of fentanyl. And many times these drugs are either being sold as heroin or being mixed with heroin in order to keep the cost of producing it low but keeping revenue prospects relatively high. So um, a small kind of background as I kind of flip through these uh, various press releases that have happened over the past um, five or six years is that heroin is an opiate, which basically means that it is produced from the plant opium. So in order to make heroin, you actually have to cultivate poppy 
you have to extract um, opium from the plant and then you have to mix it with a variety of things, cook it in a way to turn it into heroin. Opioids are synthetically made, so you can produce them in a laboratory. So if you think about the cost to a drug cartel or drug producers, having acres and acres of poppy that can be easily detected by organizations like the DEA or the federal police in your home state, or excuse me, your home country, who pay millions of dollars every year to burn down poppy fields is very different than being able to produce a relatively similar chemical in what we would refer to as a clandestine laboratory. You don't have to, you don't have to grow anything. You can make it synthetically in a lab. So um, the idea of this is actually not new. Um, there were several chemists who posted over time, particularly in the 80s, who suggested that, you know, if we keep kind of going down this path of prohibiting substances and throwing them on these lists, creative chemists are just going to come along and find slightly different variants that they can actually sell legally. And it is the case that this fentanyl crisis that we're experiencing currently and have been experiencing for a while is not new to the U.S. This was actually a big problem in the 80s. Um, so why is this potentially problematic? This is not going to suddenly turn into a chemistry lecture. I don't know enough about chemistry other than to be able to point out that if you see these three different chemical structures, notice that A, B, and C are three different drugs as are identified up here, fentanyl, acetyl fentanyl, and then neutral fentanyl. But notice that the differences in their chemical structure are only very slight, right? So the difference between A to B, it's missing a component. The difference between A and C is that there's an addition of a component, right? So all three of these fall under the family of fentanyls that are all often sold on the street as fentanyl. The problem though, is that there are a lot of them, right? So this is pulled from the DEA's list of controlled substances. Notice all of the different chemical substance names here on the left. On the right are the other names or frequently the names by which the common person, you or I, or someone purchasing these substances knows them as. We call them fentanyls today. In the 80s, they were called China whites. But notice that there are a whole bunch of different chemical structures that are all sold as fentanyl. And if we zoom in on them a little bit more closely, we can see that fentanyl, if we take hospital grade fentanyl up here, it's about 50 times as potent as heroin. So if you have a, a, a not novice or a you know, familiar heroin user, who has been informed that they have just purchased a product that's 50 times more potent than heroin, they have the means by which to dilute that product in order to make it of a level that they're comfortable consuming that won't result in an overdose and that will achieve their goals of experiencing a high. If on the other hand, they're sold fentanyl, but it's being sold to them called heroin and they consume the amount of what they think is heroin, but it turns out to be the same amount with 50 times more potent, that's likely gonna cause some very detrimental outcomes and likely will contribute to an overdose. So they can, so a lot of times they'll sell them at like various price points. All this here is trying to kind of note, if you think about it, the easiest way to think about a parallel would be something like the difference is if somebody were trying to sell um, a hard seltzer mm -hmm. and tricked you into buying that hard seltzer and it was actually vodka, right? So if you drink three different cans of what you think are hard seltzer that are about 5% alcohol versus three cans of vodka mixed with a little bit of water, those are going to result in some dramatically different outcomes, right? And that's what we end up seeing here. So there have been instances that have contributed to overdoses and overdose deaths where people have purchased these substances thinking that they were heroin but it turns out that there are three methyl fentanyl and they're 500 times as potent as heroin. So when they consumed it and they consumed the amount that was appropriate for them, working on the assumption that they were consuming heroin, they've consumed too much of the drug. And very differently than when we consume alcohol, right? Where we ingest alcohol orally, it passes through our stomach and into our liver and the liver breaks down a considerable portion of this. So it's not as feeling as poisonous to the body. 
if we consume too much, our stomach kind of acts as a way to evacuate it, right? So when people get sick from drinking too much, it's the body's response of saying like, hey, what are you doing? Let's expel this. It's causing us harm. If you have an individual who's consuming drugs intravenously, which is most often the method here for substances like heroin, there is no evacuation mechanism, right? So you have people who are consuming these substances, they realize in occasions that they've consumed too much and as a result um, run into these particular problems. So if we have a whole bunch of these drugs that are a variety of different potencies that are all being called the same thing and being sold as the same thing, many times sellers also don't know, right? So that's another big problem. If you have people who have a comparative advantage in you know, operating a drug cartel or a drug syndicate um, and they hire chemists, it's not, you know, your, your Nobel laureate chemists are not going to be the people that are going to be attracted to having these particular jobs. And sometimes it's very easy to unintentionally make uh, three methyl fentanyl instead of alpha methyl fentanyl. And then you end up selling it thinking it's one substance, but in fact, it's another. So it's not the case that's often reported in the media as though like drug dealers are out there trying to like systematically kill their customers, right? Like that doesn't rationally make sense. There's no incentive to do that unless we just assume all drug dealers are like serial killers, which probably is not true, right? That's not the most accurate comparison to make. Instead, what's likely going on is that even those drug dealers that ultimately sell to that consumer don't know what it is exactly that they're selling. So we end up getting people working with a lot of just really bad information um, that are causing a lot of these negative outcomes. Um, I'll skip over this. I'll kind of talk about it generally as I skip through. Um, the government tried to fix this problem in the 1980s by basically saying analogs will be treated the same as their uh, parent drug, but they added some clauses in there that um, they had to be intended, you had to prove that they were intended for human consumption. So if you ever wanted to know why uh, bath salts are called bath salts, it's because they were sold calling them bath salts so that if ever uh, an individual was caught consuming them, the seller could say, hey, I sold them bath salts, right? Like I didn't know that they were actually gonna orally ingest this. I am now not liable for this bad outcome. I sold them something, if they chose to misuse it, that's on them. Um, so, so a lot of people have no idea where the name bath salts originally came from. This is where it is. This is where it has its origins. Calling something plant food and if they ended up consuming it after you told them not to, it's not your fault that they got high, at least was the rationale invoked by many producers um, of these substances. All right. So let's talk a little bit about information asymmetries. I'll show you this. Think about like Matilda's dad, um, if you saw that movie as a kid, or the market for lemons when it comes to used cars. If you have a whole bunch of illegal drugs changing hands, it's not obvious that the final consumer is always going to be presented with the most relevant information about the product. Along the way, if there, are, if there is not um, an incentive to convey the most accurate information all the time due to fears of uh, potentially selling drugs to a confidential informant or to an undercover police officer. You might be a little bit circumscript about what you share about those products. You've got a whole bunch of different substances all being sold under the same name. So when you have um, health officials trying to deal with these due to like an overdose, right? So EMS responds and you only know that they consume fentanyl, but you don't know which variant. They don't necessarily know if they have enough naloxone to help with the problem or uh, with some of your more party drugs, there have been instances where people have gone to the emergency room and not known what type of experimental drug they consumed. And the treatments to deal with an overdose for stimulant type A can be very different than stimulant type B. And if you treat for A, but you really consume B, it can create a whole host of problems. So the medical community is kind of playing catch up in a way that um, can actually get very, very problematic for them. And again, it's not because you don't have well-intentioned people. It's just you've got consumers working with really bad information and then trying to convey that to health officials. There just tends to be this huge breakdown in ways that we do not see if there's a breakdown if you accidentally ingest too much of your prescription medication. 
right? Like you can immediately convey that information. You can present them with a bottle. They know exactly what you've taken and they can take the, the necessary steps there. But because all of this is trying to operate kind of in the darkness outside of the legal structure, we end up getting these really perverse outcomes that have resulted in those deaths that we started off talking about. So what I'm gonna do now in the interest of time, because I already talked a little bit longer than I intended, my apologies. I wanted to open it up if people had questions um, or wanted to talk about kind of where do we go from here? Uh, is there any optimistic side to any of this? So I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. And if you had any questions that you wanted to ask,